You're listening to Dirty Feet, a podcast from No More Radio. Vous écoutez le podcast Dirty Feet sur les ondes de No More Radio. Hosted by, animé par, Alison Burns, J.D. Papillon, et Stéphanie Morin-Robert. Stay tuned. We're going to move you. Continuing on our coverage of dance in Saskatoon, we're going to be speaking next with Mickey Mappen, who is uh, one half of a dance duo, a uh, little company here called KSAMB, Kazam, and she's working with Kyle Severson, uh, and they've been together uh, since 2009, uh, working uh, collaboratively. Thank you so much for joining us, Mickey. Well, thanks, thanks for inviting me. Uh, so perhaps we can start with uh, your background in dance and where you trained and in what style you work in and all that. Okay, well, I, there's not a lot to say because I'm actually, actually I'm kind of a, a neophyte to dance. I started dancing only about, um, just about 10 years ago. I, um, and at quite late in life, I was, uh, I was 49 years old when I began. So, yeah, it sort of put me at a bit of a disadvantage with uh, other dancers. I just, um, it's something that I'd always wanted to do all my life, but I felt that, um, well, for many various reasons, <laughs> that I couldn't or shouldn't. And, um, and uh, I would say in my 40s, my health was starting to suffer, you know, the normal aging process and everything. And so I decided that before I turned 50, I was going to have to do something about that. And I just hated the idea of going to a gym or anything boring like that. And I thought, well, maybe this is the time to, for me to uh, do what I always wanted to do and start learning to dance. So, yeah, so I started with... Um, actually, I started taking mime with a um, classically trained mime artist that lives here in Saskatoon by the name of Frank Engel. He trained in Germany, in Berlin, um, at a classical academy of... I'm not sure which one. And um, so he was doing... Um, classes in mime, and uh, and I started doing that, and and it wasn't what most people would consider, or you know, the stereotypical idea of mime. It was more like very very basic ballet training, um, because of his classical background. As far as he was concerned, uh, at the rate that um, we were studying, it was going to take us about you know. 20 years before we could even start to do some basic mime stuff. We had to prepare our bodies. And so it was really very rigorous and interesting training. I did that for quite a few years. That's, so that's what I started with. Then um, the next thing that I did was I, um, I worked with uh, a person who you've already talked to, Jackie Latondress, and I took modern dance with Jackie. And so that was a mixture of, um, you know... Um, sort of um, Graham and Laban and various different sort of techniques and uh, so yeah I did a little bit of basics in that feeling very inadequate of course I was much older than uh, all the other dancers and uh, much slower to learn things but uh, but I persevered and uh, and then I joined a group here in Saskatoon that had been going for um, about Oh, 23 years or so at the time when I joined it, it's called the Saskatoon Improv Dance Collective. Or more colloquially, we called it Thursday Night Improv because it had been going on Thursday nights for over 20 years. It was started here by uh, Linda Rubin, who now lives in Edmonton. But uh, she's she was here in Saskatoon for several years and uh, got this group going, and they just sort of continued on with that impetus ever since. And so it was a... It was a uh, an improv collective. Uh, we would do a half-hour structured warm-up every that, that was um, the one that they had been taught by Linda Rubin, um, and uh, then followed by various um, different improv techniques, and then some free improv dancing. And so that was something. That, so that, I've been doing that ever since. And. Um, and then I guess uh, well through that group I met Kyle. And Kyle, um, uh, Kyle, one of her passions, um, Kyle has r really very good training. She's a bit younger than me, and she's, um, uh, she trained as a, uh, an acrobat and, uh, in ballet in her youth. But her, one of her passions um, is contact improv dance. 
And so she's the one that uh, introduced me to that discipline. Um, and we did, you know, we did some through the um, improv group. But um, I began traveling with her. She, we would often, we, we, we try and go to workshops whenever they're happening in the, in the vicinity. And so um, the first one I went to was a, an, an intensive workshop with Martin Keel. Uh, and that was held in Calgary, I believe. And so that was my first serious introduction to contact improv. And I really loved it. Uh, and after that, so Kyle and I continued to dance together, and uh, out of that came our dance collaboration. We started performing. We did our first piece for um, an event that Jackie La Tendresse organizes every summer here in Saskatoon called Back Alley Antics. And Back Alley Antics is quite um, an amazing event. The idea uh, is that a, an area of town is chosen and uh, um, a map is drawn showing some back alleys where performers will pick a location. And so the performers who wish to participate pick locations, and then on the uh, designated night, the uh, audience gathers at a predetermined place, and there's a guide, and uh, the audience is then taken on a tour of all these back alley locations where they find all these different performances, largely movement-based performances, though there's also been poetry and um, even dramatic kind of pieces as well. So it's, um, it's quite an exciting and, and very popular little um, event. And so we, we did our first real performance, the two of us, for the, um, that, and I think that was in 2009. And so that's kind of where we date our collaboration and our company from. And after that, we got more serious. And so we perform um, every year in different places. And usually we do the back alley antics. This year, I didn't perform. Kyle performed with some other friends of ours. But, uh, yeah. It seems that uh, your, well, it says right here, your choreography is based on your practice of contact improvisation. So that's still very much an element of, of, of what you're doing together. Uh, and and also this, this concept of, of choosing new spaces so other than the or was this inspired perhaps by the back alley antics to to go out and find a new space to perform in rather than the, your typical theater um i wouldn't say so i think i think um i think in a way it's the other way around that the, the back alley antics we found really inspiring because both of us for different reasons um really like that kind of site-specific work I've, I've actually, I started as a sculptor in the um, late 70s and doing site-specific work and some performance-related work. Um, and, um, and it's been an interest of, me, of mine all my life. Like, I've worked most of my life in theater as a, as a scenic designer and then as a designer of theater uh, performance spaces. Um, for about 12 years, I had a company in Barcelona. Um, and... S- so you knew the secret was to uh, to just find the set already made rather than <laughs> well, put it together. Part of it, I, I think, it's just just that I, I've you know I've always had a great appreciation for um, um, human bodies in space. You know, like in, in in a sense, that's what architecture is, and then also performance. I mean, I realized that um, you know theatrical events are created. They're they're nurtured in a way by the space, but they're you know they're created by the relationship between the uh, the performers and the audience, and so some spaces can enhance that more than others. And um, as far as uh, you mentioned site specific work, is there uh, a certain space or a certain type of space that you're uh, naturally drawn to, or that you find yourself going back to, um, whether it's you know, a field or, or somewhere a little more closed in? Or do you find that um, there's a certain space that inspires your work or movement and performance a little more? No, I don't think so. We, we, we seem to get in excited by different kinds of space. I mean, we both love performing in a real theater. Um, I think some of our best shows, the ones that we felt the most satisfied Um, have been in places like the Refinery Theatre here in Saskatoon. I don't know if you've seen a show there. I know there's some fringe shows there. It's a lovely little space with, you know, full uh, technical support. And so, I mean, there's nothing like having, you know, really good sound and lighting and, and a a nice dance floor and the, the audience sitting in a comfortable position so that they can concentrate and you can see them and you're up close to them and everything. No, that, I mean, that is thrilling. Um, and so, in terms of outdoors, um, 
you know, I think we've uh, we we're, we're happy to sort of perform or improvise with uh, <laughs> with whatever we find. Um, you know, whether that be climbing a tree or uh, uh, going for a skinny dip in a in a slough on the prairies or. Uh, um, you know, whatever whatever we find in urban setting, the um, you know the back alleys can be very suggestive. The, the sort of the gritty, um, curious architectural spaces that you find. Um, no, no, I, I would say our dance is more inspired, um, in a sense, by the contact improv. Though I think our performances, you you know, like a lot of contemporary dance, you will see watching us perform elements of contact. Um, contact improv and depending on our performance on the show you'll see more or less um, some shows that we've done you really you wouldn't really necessarily notice that but but that's kind of just a starting point for us and so really what our dance is about is is about the human connection between us between whatever the concept is that we have sometimes we have one at the beginning sometimes we sort of develop one through the space or just by whatever the improv is that we start doing and then uh, and then there's a bit of a push and pull between the two of us because we have such wildly different backgrounds um, we'll start doing something very abstract or silly um, and I'll often for example try and impose a narrative though not as much as at first um, and then Kyle, as a choreographer, often will work in opposition to that. Um, and we end up with something that, by the time we perform it, neither of us really knows what it means, but um, it tends to be quite poetic or dreamlike, and audiences seem to um, react really well and come up with all kinds of different interpretations about what they've just seen so so we're always you know so we're often trying to break the narrative like unlike the piece that you're dancing where it seems to be pretty um, well it's similar but but you have uh, you know it would be it would be like no we wouldn't be staying with the water theme we'd be <laughs> going different places probably and you you mentioned the uh, that there was contact dance events or, or every Thursday that was organized and everyone would gather and, and kind of explore in that way. Is that something that still exists in Saskatoon? Um, yeah, it, it's n the, the, the Improv Dance Collective is not actually specifically contact. Mm. Um, when I first joined it, um, it was around the time of my 50th birthday and more than half the group were celebrating their 50th birthdays around that time, it seems. Um, now, it has sort of changed. It, uh, and so there, w there was a certain amount of contact taught, experimented with, but most of the group at that point in their lives were kind of scared of doing contact because of fear of injuries. Kyle was really the only one that was enthused about contact, and of course then she infected me with her enthusiasm. <laughs> um, it's quite contagious. <laughs> yeah, and so over the years things have changed. Um, most of the original members of the group have um, retired, um, Kyle and I are a little um, perturbed by that. Like, how do you retire from dancing? You just transform your, your style. <laughs> Into a sort statue. Of, well, whatever. No, I mean, you know, the, you, you, you know, we all deal with injuries mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And, um, and Kyle and I have, have done work, you know, working around injuries. And it's, it can be a... Um, it's like any other limitation that you, you impose on yourself uh, uh, artistically. It can be a source for... Um, for creative inspiration, I think uh, limitations. So, so anyway, but um, criticisms aside. So that was the um, the thing. No, the group does continue. Um, the last year has been really difficult, as I say, because a lot of the or um, original longtime members have retired. It's been very difficult to maintain a steady group. We'll get a few more people interested for a while. Perhaps it'll take on a more contacty character for a couple of months. Uh, then you know people move on. Um, it's it's been hard to find people who are dedicated, and so we've it's been a, it's been but we've kept it going. So um, and uh, I was just lining up studio space. That's another problem sometimes is getting studio space. Just lining up studio space for the coming fall. So we're gonna we're gonna keep trying. Uh, we did start a contact class last year on Saturdays, organized by Kyle, which um, had some success, and. Um, 
Yeah, and, and we, we, we have another couple of events that we try and keep going. One is um, uh, at Dance Saskatchewan. Through our company, we have a, a membership with Dance Saskatchewan as a, um, a young, uh, uh, a new creation company. And so we get a special deal on studio space. It's like a grant that they offer. And, um, and so we run a company class, and we do a ballet class twice a week. So with uh, Kyle and another friend, Carla, leading the ballet class. And, uh, and then the other event that we have been organizing is um, for quite a few years now. It was started by a friend, but we've kind of taken over. It's called Dance Church. And so that's why I kind of looked surprised at you when you said you were at Daki, Jackie's Dance Church. But uh, no, no, Dance Church is, um, <laughs> is, uh, is, is a bit more like a, an aesthetic dance event held every Saturday morning from 10.30 to 12. So that's why it's called Dance Church. And uh, we usually hold that also at Dance Saskatchewan, but in the summer you were talking to me about events in Montreal, and so we've, we've been holding it in the parks in, in the summer here in Saskatoon. In the description of your company, uh, you mentioned that, that you are two women who defy conventions by being yourselves. I'm wondering if this factors into the kind of work that you end up making. Oh, I think so. Um, once again, we're very different. Um, I'm, I'm a trans woman. Um, Kyle is, uh, is not. Um, but in her style, she's somebody who, who likes to play a bit with gender, I would say. Um, most of the time she defies gender, but on occasion she will, um, um, you know, go for it and get all femmed up. Um, and um, and so from the beginning, that has often been an element in some of our performances, an element of um, um, breaking gender norms a little bit or playing around a little bit with gender. So that's, that's one of the themes that, that kind of comes and goes in our work. It's, it's not central, but um, yeah. Um, and as far as uh, being an artist, a performer here in Saskatoon, is there something that you crave or that you would like to do or that you, you've lined up and you dream about? What's, what's, um, what's your plan? What's coming up next in your creative mind? <laughs> well, n we're not very good at planning. <laughs> um, we sort of tend to go with the flow, um, partly because... Um, Kyle is a person who doesn't like commitment, uh, I could say, in some ways, <laughs> though she's totally committed to dance. And um, uh, I'm a person who's a little bit post-commitment, could we say. I, I, I call myself semi-retired. And so we take a kind of casual attitude. And so some of the things that we could do if we did plan, we're not. Um, we, 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 we tried for a while to get government grants, and now we've kind of given up on that whole thing. Um, um, but we have talked. A dream would be to do a full-length show. Um, I'm not sure how we would manage to do that, but, uh, mm -hmm. but that's something that we've talked about and that would be a, a definite dream for us. And have you guys ever um, used video or any kind of outside source to document? Because there's a, a, a huge element of improvisation and being spontaneous. Um, do you turn to video to often kind of recapture moments like that? Yes. No, we, we, we do. We have, um, uh, we have tried to document most of our work. Uh, you can see a little bit of it on the mm -hmm. website. But... And, and actually, there was a time earlier on when we tried very seriously. This was part of our government grant applications. We tried for a Canada Council... Um, um, oh, I can't remember what the category was called again. But um, um, And it seemed to be very well received by the councillors in... Uh, the, the consultants in um, Ottawa and everything, the, the whole proposal. We did not get the funding. But, but uh, our proposal was to get funding to work on the... The, um, that connection, that possible mm -hmm. connection between dance and video. And so we did do some experimental videos for a while where we were kind of trying to let the two play off of each other. And, th and that's what we'd hoped to do at the time was to be able to have access to enough money and production facilities to be able to video dance and movement sections and then project them and then dance with that 
and kind of work on that because we have seen some some effective work done in performance with dance and video but a lot of it seems to it makes it it often seems to detract sometimes from the dance or the, the either the dance detracts from the video or the video detracts from the dance and it's not always well integrated and so that's what we were hoping to explore was sort of integrating that and also the idea like living in a provincial place like Saskatoon out of the sort of centers um, one of the big problems is audience um, there's a very small de- audience for contemporary dance here and which of course makes it hard to make a living or you know seriously do that kind of work uh, or keep serious dancers in town and um, and as a small company we, we thought that that would be a definite outlet would be if we could do more video production work it's a, it's a way to get what we do seen outside of Saskatoon since you have had the opportunity to dance a bit in Montreal and in Toronto as you mentioned just before we started recording uh, and and having this unique perspective of joining the community later in life can you give us uh, some some idea of kind of the comparing and contrasting between the scenes you've experienced whether it be you know in terms of the audience available or or do you see styles and trends in, in performers well, in terms of the audience available I haven't had a lot of chance to see contemporary dance in sort of normal venues in Montreal and Toronto. I'd love to be able to do that, but I just can't afford it. I have a very basic kind of lifestyle. Um, in terms of what I experienced this um, this winter when I was out there, oh yeah, no, I, I really did notice a difference. Um, and uh, the one example that really stood out for me, um, I mentioned that I... Uh, that we organize a group called Dance Church every Sunday morning, and it's um, um, it's a, a, sort of a bit like a static dance. It's it's just um, basically we put on a playlist, and uh, everybody dances the way they they wish, and it's become quite successful. Um, and for us, success means having like maybe ten people every time, sometimes as many as twelve. And uh, so I went to a similar event in Toronto that was that's called the. Uh, the Move Collective, and uh, and they have their every Friday night they have a dance at um, uh, the Dover Court Center there, and I remember when I arrived the the difference it was really really stark because uh, I got there early um, it's uh, you know I didn't know the city in so I didn't want to be late and, and it was a good thing that I was early because when I got there they, there was. Uh, a woman handing out numbers, and I had to get a number, and, and I, it was explained to me that they have they hand out a hundred numbers, and anybody who comes too late um, and doesn't get a number, then they can't dance that night, and so so that was just you know for us a good turnout is ten. Well, in Toronto they've got more than a hundred every Friday for this event, and so that really you know was quite a difference and it was a wonderful experience to dance in this room full of a hundred people uh, um, and, and yeah and, and I think as I mentioned to you too the time I spent in Montreal I was uh, in Toronto and Montreal but in Toronto I, I was able to dance um, every day and sometimes twice a day with different events classes um, groups collectives uh, and yeah that's uh, that's definitely a difference from Saskatoon you mentioned earlier too before we started recording that you were a fan of the uh, the title of our show Dirty Feet and uh, we noticed the first time we met you that you weren't wearing any shoes <laughs> and I'm wondering uh, where that comes from um, yeah it's interesting that you you noticed that because I was actually thinking about that when I saw the title I was thinking about that this morning again uh, looking at Dirty Feet and thinking hmm, that's kind of special to me partly because of the dance studio um, connection but yeah I, I I've started um, not wearing shoes um, when I walk around the city uh, this year. It, um, it, it comes from my childhood. I, I, I think like a lot of people, I really loved going barefoot in the summer. And, um, and I think over the years I've seen a few um, you know, people who do go barefoot in an urban setting, for example. Um, uh, I remember in Montreal, uh, in Barcelona, when I lived there, seeing a, you know there was a couple of people, sort of very much street people, with very dirty feet, who um, went without shoes, and um, and I think in the last quite a few years, several years, I've I've uh, I've taken to walking with um, um, 
you know, less and less supportive shoes, and I found that that's really good for my feet. And I know when I would go out in the country, whenever it seemed to be, um, you know, nice dirt paths and things like that, I would walk barefoot. So I'm not really sure what inspired me this um, summer. Well, well, one thing is that here in Saskatoon, we have a man by the name of Fred Flowers. He's a, he's, um, he, he has a... Um, a percussion he sponsors um, you know percussion jams but um, he also is a, is a Buddhist and he, he goes barefoot a lot and I've even seen him in the winter at 20 below walking down Broadway barefoot and so that, that definitely impressed me and um, so yeah I'm not sure what inspired me but this, um, this spring I uh, just started walking a little bit barefoot see what it was like and, um, and it just felt so good that I thought, well, maybe I'm going to try and extend this and see how far I can walk. Uh, I walk a lot. I walk and ride my bike everywhere, and I, I, I prefer walking. And so whenever I can, I walk. And so I, I tend to walk maybe, you know, at least 40 minutes, maybe an hour and a half um, in a day, um, getting around town. And, and so I started off sort of small. Maybe I'd walk one half of the trip to my studio or something and then bring some shoes to walk home. And I would try and be really careful, of course, worried about, you know, in the urban setting, things like glass and um, needles and things. But, but as I walked more, my feet got a little tougher. I began to realize I could walk a lot more places than I thought I could at first. And there really isn't that much glass. And, and it's quite easy to spot it before you step on it. And so... Uh, so yeah, so now I just kind of uh, walk everywhere. I even walk, um, you know, gravel is not a problem. I walk across uh, railway tracks. Um, the yeah, it's it's quite amazing. And and then I was as I was at Sainty, what I what kind of interested me about it. I mean, it feels really good. Um, I I remember reading a study that was um, saying that. Um, for older people, they had been experimenting with older people that were having problems with balance and, and other cognitive issues, and that um, stimulating the feet by, by using things like those, those rubber sandals that have little rubber fingers poking up would, um, would give all kinds of benefits in terms of balance and, and other mental functions, um, just stimulating the nerves in the feet. And I know this spring, the spring was very cold and wet here in Saskatoon, um, and I would, I would think, oh, maybe I should wear boots or something. And, uh, but then I think, oh, my boots will just get soaked. And, of course, feet don't mind getting wet. Um, and so I would just go barefoot. And it just felt so good to be walking through the water, feel the cool, the temperatures, the different textures of the ground, the grass, the, 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 the pebbles, the different kinds of concrete and asphalt. It's really, like, sometimes there's a bit of pain, but it's not like masochistic. It just, it feels alive. I, I, I really appreciate it. There, there are moments when I'm just walking along and I just think um, there's a sort of a world of sensory information that comes through your feet that I think most of us are missing. Very interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm tempted to try it. I don't know if Montreal is a place to start, though. Perhaps while we're here in Saskatoon, that should be the experimentation <laughs> ground. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why it shouldn't be. I, I'm, I'm thinking about the same thing when I travel next. I'm wondering, hmm, in the big city. like As I say, I saw people who went barefoot in, in Barcelona, and I think you just learn to keep an eye out. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's a natural human function. Humans, humans have walked barefoot for millennia, and uh, there's lots of sharp things on the ground, um, and you just kind of learn to watch out for them. Something very tragic, I think, about um, dancers' careers is sometimes they end up uh, retiring early. And you mentioned this earlier in one of your responses, talking about how it was absurd that they would retire when they get older, that that's not the way to do it, and that you started later in life and that you're finding all these these benefits to it. And you mentioned that it was was mostly inspired by uh, uh, wanting to be in better health. So now having danced for quite a few years, can you speak to, to what's happened to your body? Oh, yeah. My, my body has really changed. My health has improved incredibly. As I, as I said, I was having health problems of various sorts. I had problems with shin splints in my legs from walking, and I'd gone through the whole process of trying all kinds of um, inner soles and, you know, fancy shoes and things. Um, 
And, you know, I had back pains. I was having problems with arthritis um, in my 40s. And, um, and I think a lot of that had to do with stress and various other things. But, um, but no, when I started dancing, I could... Um, I remember the warm-up that we did for the uh, Thursday night improv group, the Saskatoon Improv Collective, the one that um, Linda Rubin had um, originally taught the group. I found it really, really hard. That it was a, it's like um, a floor warm up, and 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 for example, I ha- I had gotten to the point where I couldn't. Well, for most of my life, I couldn't sit on the floor. For example, if I, if you were at an event and you had to sit on the floor to watch or or whatever, just to spend some time, I would be in pain within thirty seconds. You know, I'd have to start shifting around and trying to find different ways to sit and. Um, and this floor warm-up that we did, I could see right away it really challenged those very problems. Um, and I persevered, and I guess I got stronger. My posture improved, um, walking, standing, sitting. I can sit now for long periods of time on the floor. I um, uh, Walking, um, the, the troubles that I had with my legs have almost completely gone away uh, with my feet Um, the arthritis seems to have for quite a while mostly disappeared Um, so no the the benefits were were numerous and I and I I say to people and it it really is true like during my 40s I felt I was getting old I felt I was really getting aging fast Um, despite not going the way a lot of older people do and and you know like I think a lot of people decide that they're getting old and then begin to change their lifestyle as well because they're old, you know. They feel that they've become old. Well, I was trying to resist that, but my body wasn't cooperating during my 40s. But once I started dancing at 49, my feeling has been that throughout my 50s, and I'm now 58, um, I have been getting younger. Um, people say that I look younger. My posture has definitely improved. My endurance has improved like I was saying the job I was doing the last couple of days um, and my health in every way has improved all those things that I was suffering from have uh, have turned around I think I'm getting to the point now where I don't think I'm gonna I'm getting younger anymore (laughs) I think I'm gonna start aging again in the way that um, we all do Um, but um, but it certainly was a wonderful experience uh, to, to, in my 50s to you know, feel like I was getting younger. And I really think that um, there's no reason why I can't continue to dance until, until I'm very old. I mean, uh, dance is many things. I feel like you can dance, um, you know, as you can even... Well, one of the... One of the, one of the um, ideas taught in contact improvisation um, it comes from one of the very early pioneers and I can't remember his name right now um, is called the small dance and that's simply the dance that happens when you are still and become aware of your body and aware of all the minute muscle movements and internal movements that are taking place in the stillness um, and so no dance I think uh, can can last for a long time. One one person that I often think about is a is a poet um, who she was a I think won the award the Governor General's Award for Poetry in Canada. Uh, she's a, a Canadian poet from Saskatoon, Anne Shumagalski. She's dead now, but um, she was an inspiration to me when uh, I remember seeing her dance many years ago and. Uh, she would dance with, um, you know, little contemporary groups. And, and she was really quite old at the time, also overweight, like not physically fit, but, um, but just marvelous to see how she could let go and, and dance. And, and I know for myself, one of the things for me um, starting dance late in life was to, to let go of that idea of dignity. Um, you know, I had to learn to be, look really foolish, I think, sometimes. Um, in order to dance, and that that's also a, f- a very freeing thing. And and I don't think 
I don't know. As you get older, I think, like, you can dance in so many ways. I, I will, having started late in life, I will never, for example, be able to do the type of moves that my, um, uh, my partner, Kyle, can do with her training and uh, well-prepared body. But, um, but I can perform, and I do have performance skills, and I can move, and with a good choreographer, uh, the, 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 the dancing that I can do can be quite powerful in the right context, in the right um, situation. And so it's, it's, it's not all about young athletic bodies. No, it's, it's a, there's a lot more to dance than that. I'm, I'm loving what you have to say. I'm also very aware that our listening audience is probably the choir, that they, are, they already are in love with dance, but I just feel like everyone should try it because <laughs> that's incredible. There are so many, so many things that it offers. Um, I, I also understand that your company, part of your mandate is to, to bring dance to an audience that isn't necessarily familiar with it. Is that not part of what you try to do? Um, yeah, I, I don't know if we call it a mandate. It's just something that's happened um, and that we like to do. For example, the, the Back Alley Antics or, organized by Jackie Latendres do encourage um, your non-traditional dance audiences in many cases. We've, um, just through various community connections, we've ended up doing, for example, we, we've done performed a few times now for the Bengali community, and uh, they want us back. And that was really quite interesting. It started as a sort of an f- informal party in the uh, rec room of uh, the building where a woman that I, I met, Javanessa Chapala, from, from, um, originally from Bangladesh. And um, actually, we met through the radio station. Um, and she invited us. They, they had various people in their community um, performing and, a couple, and some other people in an informal way. For the, for the guests at this um, social event. And so uh, we were invited to perform. So Kyle and I did a little improv based on something that we'd been working on, just on the carpet. In the, and um, uh, we didn't have musical inter- um, accompaniment, so we asked uh, Jevanessa herself to accompany us on the uh, Bengali organ. Um, um, and, um, and so uh, and we did an improv. And... People were very interested and very impressed. So we've performed in more formal settings for them now, and uh, uh, you know, at cultural events where they're showcasing Bengali traditional dancing and singing. And then there's Kyle and Miki. Uh, we we did one show with a percussionist who we know, Dwayne Dorgan, who we often work with. And um, people were really very interested and supportive of what we do. You know that. And, and so it, it's quite interesting to see that, um, um, that it can connect with people on many different levels. Um, one piece that we toured a few years ago, um, uh, actually it was, it was called Kazam One, um, and uh, we, we performed with a ladder. And we did that in many different situations. We did it in a formal theater setting, which was very successful. We also did it... Um, on the lawn for a, a film festival, um, various different um, places, and once again, it got really interesting reactions from a lot of people. Like interested reactions, um, you know. People found different people found different things that they found uh, absorbing about it. Uh, you mentioned the website earlier for Kazam. Can you just give us the URL so that our listeners can uh, can search you out? Yes, you can. You can find a little bit more information about Kazam at Kazam. That's K S A M B dot Weebly. That's W E E B L Y dot com. Perfect. We've been speaking with Miki Mappen uh, here in in Saskatoon. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Dirty Feet was previously recorded at the Montreal Improv Theatre and is currently recorded out of Mainline Theatre. 
Thanks, dudes. Dirty Feet est produit et animé par Produced and hosted by Alison Burns J.D. Papillon et Stéphanie Morin-Robert. You can find out more about our show at nomoreradio.com, follow us on Twitter at Dirty Dirty Feet and find us on Facebook at Dirty Feet Podcast. Vous pouvez écouter tous nos épisodes sur notre site web ou vous pouvez vous abonner également sur iTunes à notre podcast. Listen to past episodes on website or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. While you're there, be sure to give us a rating and or leave a comment to help us spread the word. Tune in next week for a whole new show. Mm-hmm.